what I realized is if you really go back to first principles, there's only three inputs that a product leader or product manager has to making a decision. You can have data, you can have feedback from customers, so you can have conversations with customers. And then the third thing, which is just as important is your own intuition as a product leader. And so the combination of analytics, customer feedback, and intuition are really the pillars of product decision-making. And the best product teams focus on striking a balance between those things. The other thing that is challenging is every single product team that I've worked with biases towards one mode of decision-making or another. At TripAdvisor, the PMs really biased towards analytical decision-making. At other companies, especially early stage, sometimes teams bias towards intuitive decision-making. Other times, especially for sales-driven teams, they bias towards feedback or customer-driven decision-making. And so the important thing is to be aware of the bias that you have and to be very thoughtful about striking a balance between those three modes of decision-making. Each is very powerful. Each mode is very powerful, but each also comes with a downside. My next guest in the 1% project is Ravi Mehta. Ravi was the chief product officer at Tinder product director at Facebook and VP consumer products at TripAdvisor. In this conversation, he talks about why product development is challenging and exciting, the mental and execution frameworks that product managers can develop, how product managers can make better decisions, why products of Facebook, Tinder, and TripAdvisor have stood the test of time when hundreds of clones enter the market every year, why difficulty in prioritization is a strategy problem, the evolution of the Chinese tech product ecosystem in the last 10 years, metaverse, and much more. If you have any feedback about this conversation, speaker, or topic recommendations, you can drop me a line at pratish at the rate 1%.live. You can also sign up for the 1% Project newsletter at 1%.live for show notes and key insights on this conversation and every other conversation. We kick this conversation off with Ravi asking him about his experience as an executive in residence at Reforge. It's been a really wonderful experience. So I've been an executive in residence with Reforge for the last 18 months. As of right now, I'm the longest tenured, uh, tenured executive in residence at Reforge. I've stayed there for uh, longer than the other EIRs and in part because I've just been enjoying it so much. I've known Brian, the CEO of Reforge, for a long time. I actually joined Brian at his first startup when we were just a handful of people in a rundown building in a suburb of Boston. And so I've known Brian for a long time. And the first uh, time when I was really introduced to Reforge was because people on my product team at TripAdvisor wanted to take the Reforge program. And what I found after that experience where people were coming out of the Reforge programs at this point, it was the growth series with a very different outlook in terms of how to approach product, a much more sophisticated outlook. And I saw that and wanted more of the people on my team to have that opportunity. So that was something that I encouraged the TripAdvisor. It was something that I encouraged in Tinder. We had a whole set of people go through the Reforge program when I was the chief product officer at Tinder. And each time I saw people coming out of that with not just ideas, but really tools, frameworks that they could use to more effectively think through the set of challenges that we have as product leaders, which is often dealing with things where there's some pattern that we can use, but where there's not a clear solution. And so I was able to see the power of that as a leader before I was able to be part of the company. Over the last 18 months as an executive in residence, I've hosted programs on product strategy, I helped create the program on product leadership. I've hosted that program as well. And one of the reasons I decided to join Reforge was I was at a really pivotal point in my career. I had been at larger companies for the last 10 years or so at Facebook, TripAdvisor, and Tinder. And I was starting to think about what I wanted to do next. And I wanted some time and space to potentially start something new and really explore opportunities. And Reforge was able to give me that time and space. But even more importantly, I wanted to pay things forward. I had spent a lot of time managing teams, helping companies achieve their objectives. Product as an, as an industry, as a profession has really evolved. And I wanted to pay forward some of the things that I've learned and help other people get into product and really level up as product managers and product leaders. So it's been a stellar experience. I've learned a lot. I've had a lot of fun creating things. It's really challenged me from a, in terms of the, the clarity of my thinking and, and how I approach things. And so just been a stellar experience from, from the day I started. 
is building a product hard and why is it? It's a good question. There's a lot of things that have made product development a lot easier. I recently started a new, a new company focused on helping more people get access to professional coaching. And so far we haven't hired any engineers. We've been doing everything in no code and that's allowed us to move really quickly. The types of things that we can build, the sophistication of things that we can build using tools like Webflow and Zapier and ConvertKit and other tools, it's really remarkable. And so in many ways, the ability to create a product has gotten significantly easier. And I think if you look at the history of a product management, you know, product management is a dual role that's both technology focused as well as customer focused. And as the technology has gotten easier, the customer side, I think, has actually gotten harder. And the reason the customer side has gotten harder is because there are so many products out in the world. So people are using many different products. People have established habits around products that they're using. People are willing to try new things, but only when there's a clear benefit. And so that fundamental process as a product leader of understanding what is it that a customer wants truly and how do you create value for them in the product uh, that you're building is as hard as it ever was and maybe even harder because of all the in behavior and all of the new things that customers want to do. Jeff Bezos has a really good quote. I always butcher it, but it's something to the effect of one thing you count on is customers will always be dissatisfied. When you solve one problem for them, they move on to wanting a solution to the next problem. And that is both really challenging, but also really fulfilling to focus on that. The PM's role is becoming more and more complex with so many moving aspects that are coming in. What kind of frameworks should PMs develop? It's a, it's a great question. I think one of the things that's interesting about product is many years ago, engineering started to specialize into front end and back end and AI and, and DevOps. And it was the sort of thing where it was pretty clear that the scope of technology that a person would have to master in order to be a great engineer across everything was just too broad. And it was very different from the old days. Similarly, product has gotten to that place as well. The set of things that a product manager or product leader needs to master in order to do everything necessary to deliver value to a customer is so broad today that it's impossible for any one person to master all of those things. And it's been that way for a while, but I think actually product has been slow to specialize or when it's specialized in, in informal ways rather than in the very formal specialization between front end and back end. And so from a framework perspective, I think the frameworks largely depend on what type of work a product manager or product leader wants to do. And from there, based on that type of work, there's a whole set of approaches. And so if you are a product leader who really loves to focus on discovering product market fit and that really early stage of innovation and discovery, then there's a set of frameworks to be able to do that. One of the best ones is Rahul Vora has the product market fit engine, which is a really great framework. If you are focused on growth and your goal is to increase acquisition or increase engagement or retention, I believe Reforge has the best frameworks to do that. And there's really good ways to go and engage with the Reforge material and, and put together a really thoughtful and deep growth model. And so I think the set of frameworks is largely dependent on the area that you want to specialize. And so the first framework I actually recommend product managers and product leaders think about is that framework of what are the different specializations in product and where do you want to specialize and where do you want to be a generalist? Um, I think great product leaders, and this is true of leaders in general, are T-shaped. They're good at a lot of different things, but they're great at a couple of things that really differentiate themselves. And early PMs, I think, should focus on getting in, getting their first opportunity, exploring different things, and then figuring out what are the things that they really want to focus on so that they can develop that specialized talent. How would you think about a PM making good decisions? I actually have a, a blog article that I've written on this. This is something that I've thought a lot about. And as I was working on products, I started to see a pattern, which is that different product teams tend to make decisions in different ways. At the time that I started seeing this, I was at TripAdvisor. And TripAdvisor is a very quantitative company. It's a company that moves fast. It's a company that focuses on metrics. And so the thing that we often had was we would make decisions based on data, but that would sometimes mean that we added things to the product that 
we were either aesthetically not pleasing or were complex or didn't really ladder up to a really clear big problem that we were solving. And so the thing that we needed to solve for was by being very metrics oriented, we were able to consistently improve the business, but we also could sometimes end up where we're iterating towards a local maxima, or more often we could end up with a product that was a Frankenstein product. All the bits and pieces worked fine on their own, but when you put them together, it didn't look as put together and as um, thoughtful as it needed to. And so as I started to look at that and look at other product cultures, what I realized is if you really go back to first principles, there's only three inputs that a product leader or product manager has to making a decision. You can have data, you can have feedback from customers, so you can have conversations with customers. And then the third thing, which is just as important is your own intuition as a product leader. And so the combination of analytics, customer feedback, and intuition are really the pillars of product decision-making. And the best product teams focus on striking a balance between those things. The other thing that is challenging is every single product team that I've worked with biases towards one mode of decision-making or another. At TripAdvisor, the PMs really bias towards analytical decision-making. At other companies, especially early stage, sometimes teams bias towards intuitive decision-making. Other times, especially for sales-driven teams, they bias towards feedback or customer-driven decision-making. And so the important thing is to be aware of the bias that you have and to be very thoughtful about striking a balance between those three modes of decision-making. Each is very powerful. Each mode is very powerful, but each also comes with a downside. And so we already talked a little bit about analytic-based decision-making. The upside is with strong analysis with strong metrics, you're able to very confidently say, I know that these are the levers that drive value in my product. And so you can focus very confidently on the things that you feel like you've got strong out analytical evidence that they're going to work. The downside is that they can be pretty incremental. There's no amount of great analytical execution that Booking.com or TripAdvisor or HomeAway did and they were all great at analytical execution that got them to the opportunity that Airbnb unlocked. And so Airbnb unlocked a very visionary, very intuitive opportunity, which is to rethink the relationship between a renter and a rentee more as a human relationship between a host and a guest. So those are the pros and cons of analytical decision-making. Similarly with customer feedback, the fantastic thing about customer feedback is you have the strong relationship with the customer You can really optimize for it. You're not treating the customer as entities in a Petri dish, but actually as human beings who have deep needs. And so companies that are very customer focused are often great at solving the problems that their customers identify. But the place where that falls short is customers don't always know what they want, or they can't always envision the combination of what the technology can do and how it can solve their problem. I think a great example here is Uber. No customer was going to say, I want an Uber-like system instead of a taxi, but every customer knew that they wanted better ways to pay for transport, more convenient transport, more timely transport, cleaner transport. And so Uber needed to use a great sense of product intuition, a great understanding of technology to solve that that problem. And so customer feedback-driven organizations can get into the mode of being reactive to customers rather than proactive about product strategy and product vision. And then lastly, there is product intuition. Really good product intuition is essential to doing magical things with products. I think it's something that's underpinned Apple, it's underpinned Snapchat, it's underpinned Uber. But the problem with product intuition is that if you use it entirely on its own, then you run the risk of swinging a lot and missing a lot because there's no data-based or feedback-based underpinning to the decisions that you're making. So all of that means that a really strong product team will combine these different modes of decision-making in a way that they get to a balanced product decision that incorporates great intuition, really good understanding of customers through customer feedback, as well as the analytics the team has. You've mentioned in one of your blog posts that difficulty in prioritization is a strategy problem. Can you double-click on that? Yeah, definitely. So I think the first instinct when a product manager or product leader is 
working on a problem and they don't know whether or not they should do A or B, people tend to think about it from an execution standpoint and say, okay, we need a prioritization fr framework. We need to understand the impact. We need to understand the level of effort. How confident are we in these estimates? And so the idea there is to really say, okay, how can we objectively measure the prioritization of A versus B? But instead, what I've seen, and this is often the case, is when there's challenge around prioritization, it's less that the mechanism by which the team is using to prioritize isn't sophisticated enough. And it's often more the case that the team doesn't fully understand the strategy for the product that they're building. And so I think a classic example of this is on mobile, at the bottom of your app, you can have four or five at the maximum options for different spaces within your app that a person can go into. You can treat that as a design or an execution decision. You know, which should be those four or five things. But ultimately, that is a strategy decision. You're saying, here are the four or five things that we want a user to have at their fingertips in order to get the most value from our product. And so every single product decision that we make in at least consumer products or products that are used on a device needs to be rendered into pixels. And so these very, there's very tactical decisions that ultimately manifest the strategy that we're going after. And so encourage PMs when they hit prioritization decisions is rather than try to make that prioritization decision locally using some deeper framework around opportunity sizing is to really zoom out and understand what is the strategy that's driving this decision. And if there's a very clear strategy, then of course you can go in and you can say both of these are really important for our strategy. And so we need to figure out the relative importance um, relative to what we're trying to accomplish. But more often as the case is when you ask the team, what is the strategy? They're not sure. And so the reason they're having a hard time prioritizing is because they're not sure what they're doing. But if they take some time to define that strategy in a very clear way, then those prioritization decisions become clear. And teams that have a very clear strategy, there's a wonderful feeling of having a wind at your back. It becomes much easier to make decisions. It's much clearer to understand what we do and we don't do. And customers can sense that. When there is this clear strategy that is a thread throughout the product, it makes products simpler, more elegant, more focused. And so it's something that not only helps PMs in day to day, but it actually helps you deliver more value to the customer. You have led products for global companies, which have probably touched billions of lives. And for those, why have the Tinder, Facebook, TripAdvisor, and Xbox products have been able to stand the test of time and succeed, especially when hundreds of such clones come into the market? This is a place where Brian through Reforge and Andrew Chen through the work that he's doing and, and others have done a really good job of putting the highlight on network effects. Ultimately, most technology businesses benefit in significant ways from network effects. And for businesses that don't benefit from them today, there's usually a way to reframe them so that they benefit more highly from those network effects. I think one of the, the most exciting things about technology is it, it is very democratic. It opens up the ability for anyone to create a business. And we've seen so much energy and momentum around new business creation. The pace of that has just continued to increase. The creativity behind it has continued to increase. But at the same time, we see that a significant disproportionate amount of value is concentrated among a few companies like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft. And the reason is that those established players have gotten network effects going that have just continued to perpetuate. And as a result, they've gotten to a point where it's very hard for a new entrant to compete unless they're really redefining the mode of competition. So TripAdvisor is a really good example. There's been no company that's been able to compete with TripAdvisor in a meaningful scale because there are hundreds of millions of people visiting TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor has millions of reviews and opinions. There's millions of indexed pages. And so there's just this fantastic amount of established position that would be very hard for another company to compete with. So if another company came in and said, we want to create a travel review site and others have, you just don't get the, anywhere near the same level of traffic or content 
as TripAdvisor. And so you're not able to deliver as much value for the customer. One of the sort of threats to TripAdvisor is that increasingly reviews and opinions are moving into video. And so Pinterest mm. has benefited from that. Instagram has benefited from that. And so there really is a need today for a TripAdvisor that is much more video native. So if we're a startup were to come in today and say, we're going to create the ability to make travel decisions based on reviews and opinions that are in great short format video, TripAdvisor's network effects all of a sudden are invalid. They don't apply as much. And so it's much easier for companies to compete. And so we see this really exciting, but also complicated combination of entrenched players, incumbents who have strong network effects, but we technology is changing so quickly, customer behavior is changing so quickly that we also see a lot of innovation because people are feeling, figuring out new ways to deliver value and new ways to disrupt those incumbents. I don't think this kind of order of Apple, Facebook, Google, Microsoft is going to change in a fundamental way over the next 10 or 20 years. That's one of the one of the downsides of these network effects is it does inhibit competition at that level. But with things like Web3 and the metaverse, which we'll talk about, there are definitely va new vectors of competition that are meaningful and that can help people create uh, really interesting businesses. And I think one of the things that's different that actually made competition hard is that companies like Apple and Facebook and Google, they, you know, previously incumbents were really static. If you had a player that was an entrenched player, they would rest on their laurels. And you saw that in some of these industries that have been disrupted by direct-to-consumer players. So you saw that in the mattress industry, in the eyeglass industry, in the home alarm industry. Yeah. If you were an incumbent and you benefited there, you just rest on your laurels and you you knew every year you're, you were going to grow at a certain rate and you could collect a pretty nice margin. But the incumbent players in tech are not static. They're constantly innovating too. And so startups have to compete not only not only with the incumbents who have their incumbent businesses, but also with the innovation that they create. And so it leads to a challenging marketplace, but also a really yeah. exciting marketplace. Absolutely. How do you see the Amazon e-commerce experience? Because there are a number of companies, billion dollar companies now, which have been built on the shoulders of Amazon in different markets. How have they been able to differentiate themselves and still be a market leader? I think one of the things that they've really done well is they have put customer obsession above day-to-day -day optimization. So going back to what we talked about earlier with product decision-making, if you make ba decisions based on analytics, then the analytics will reveal ways that you can get more conversions. But sometimes those things are great in the short term, but they're not healthy in the long run. And so it takes a significant amount of discipline for a company I think Amazon is one of them to say, we're not going to take every single revenue opportunity we possibly can because we're not solving for what are the things that we can do today to extract the most revenue. We're solving for what are the things that we can do to build the most long-term value. And I think one of the best examples of this is abandoned cart emails are an e-commerce best practice. Almost every e-commerce site in the world sends abandoned cart emails. The idea being if you were had enough intent that you're willing to put a product in your cart, then you absolutely are likely to convert if we send you an abandoned cart email. And so let's do that. That will increase our sales. But Amazon doesn't send abandoned cart emails. Amazon's mm -hmm. actually very conservative about their email strategy. Their perspective is if they can create a comfortable experience, a safe experience, an effective experience for people that want to buy online, then those people will keep coming back. And if instead they use urgency or they overwhelm them with notifications, then they're going to potentially go away and someone else will be able to deliver a better experience. And I think that's a really important lesson for businesses is that it takes discipline to not grow as fast as you possibly can in the short term to then grow faster in the long term. And that requires that balanced product decision making where you're not just making decisions based on the analytics of what the analytics say is the optimum thing to do, but also in terms of intuitively what's great for the customer and what the customer is saying to you. And so I think that's a fantastic example of how to make balanced decision making and how to approach these problems like an industry leader that's there for the long term rather than a player that's trying to extract everything in the short term. Brilliant. On the same lines, how have you seen the Chinese ecosystem specifically on the product side evolve in the last 10 years? 
Yeah, absolutely. We were talking about this a little bit, and I know we we see things a little bit differently on this. I think there is a very interesting change of C recently. Five, seven years ago, Western companies didn't need to worry about competing with Chinese companies in a lot of domains, social being one of them. There's this sort of idea that what happens within consumer social in China is different than what happens in consumer social in the West. And U.S. companies will set the standard for what people want from consumer social social apps and be able to grow globally, X china And China will be able to create products that work well in China and maybe um, other places in Asia. But because of different cultures, because of different ways of utilizing products, because of potentially lack of understanding of the Western market, that those products wouldn't break out of that. I think today we're living in a very different world. The great example of this, the case in point, is TikTok as a Chinese company has done incredibly well at understanding the the cultural needs and wants of every single market that they've been in. And in some way, they've had some advantages because they've taken an inherently international approach from the get-go. And the TikTok feed is a great example. The TikTok feed is going to look entirely different in India than it is in the U.S. than it is in, in China. And that's something that they've just built intrinsically into their system, this idea that you can create a great consumer product that is broadly global as well as deeply local. And so I think we're going to see more of that. There's some examples like Tantan, which is really successful as a dating app in Asia. It hasn't quite made it to the West yet, but it might be a matter of time. Tencent, I think, is really interesting. If you had asked people 10, 15 years ago, do you think online gaming is going to be bigger 10 or 15 years from now or smaller, you'd say, absolutely, it's going to be bigger. But VCs were really reluctant to invest in gaming because they felt like it was a hit-driven business. And so a lot of the innovation in gaming was coming from the game industry sort of self-funding. Tencent was able to come in and say, let's actually make a broad bet. Let's invest in a lot of gaming companies. Let's build an ecosystem here that includes gaming companies on different platforms and engine companies. And today, you know, they are a significant beneficiary from all of those bets that they've made. And I think that they will have a disproportionate impact on gaming and then ultimately the metaverse. And those are two really big examples. I think we're going to continue to see more of those examples in the future. Absolutely. I think the example you talked about TikTok is very interesting. So when they were in India and when they launched from day one, they were multi-language. A lot of international entrants who have come into India spend billions of dollars. They've always tried to hit the English speaking, the top 200 million internet users. And those consumers are probably the most sought after. So they're the most expensive to get into the funnel. They are probably not the most loyal as well because they have so many options. But when TikTok came in, they basically landed up identifying key languages, local languages in India and went behind them and that basically got them to really uh, snowball the whole TikTok effect in India. And that's a very different way of looking at things. I think a lot of a lot of U.S. startups, a lot of Western startups say, we're going to be English only and we're going to focus on iOS. And we'll get to Android, we'll get to other languages a few years from now. And that's good. And that can work to build successful products. But just by definition, you're leaving out the ability to really grow globally. And you have companies like TikTok and other international companies that are saying, no, we're going to start. We might even just focus on Android, but we're going to start and focus on multiple languages. And it's a completely different way to way to go to market. Because of these network effects, because of the way in which communications has shrunk the world, has enabled trends to play out much faster, things go global much more quickly. And without that global posture, it's much harder to get that level of rapid growth that TikTok was able to, to take advantage of. So totally agree. It's a really interesting case. You talked about metaverse. So please tell us about your views on metaverse. What's happening and what's the future? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's funny because the the word metaverse has been used for such a long time. When I was at Microsoft working on online games, we first used used the word to talk about some of the things that, that we were doing. And it's really interesting to see it come back. I think as with a lot of things in tech, whether it's Web3 or the metaverse or even big data or AI or cloud computing, there's an element of hype and there's an element of reality. As I think about what's interesting about this idea around the metaverse, I think it's important to break it down and be really specific about it. Because the way in which companies are talking about it today, especially in this last round of investor calls, a lot of CEOs were quick to label their companies as metaverse companies. And so people have talked about Substack being a metaverse company or Patreon being a metaverse 
company. And if you think about it from that wide of lens, I actually think there's four different types of metaverses that are worth considering. The first one are media metaverses. And so today there already are massive media-based metaverses. Facebook is a media metaverse. Twitter is a media metaverse. Substack is a media metaverse. There continues to be desire for people to want to interact with each other in new and interesting ways to create different types of content. With Web3 and some of the innovations around NFTs and smart contracts, there's going to be new technologies that fuel that. And so an important part of this idea of the metaverse are media-based metaverses, which are already very much here and they're here to stay. And each of these media-based metaverses is really a place. And that's ultimately the thing that metaverse metaverses are solving for is they're creating distinct social places for people to engage with. The second type of metaverse are 3D metaverses. And that's already well evolved, right? You have 3D metaverses like Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite and World of Warcraft and any number of different games. Those are gonna continue to evolve. I think Roblox here is a really interesting example of a metaverse because it's one of the first 3D-based games that provide really robust creative tools with a really robust set of tools for players. So oftentimes game development companies have separated themselves and said, we're the creators and our players are the consumers. Roblox is one of the first examples of a company that said, no, we don't want that wall between creators and consumers. We actually want to enable anyone within our player set to create interesting things. And as a result, even though the graphics are, are not great, the a lot of the game mechanics aren't great. There is just this rapid innovation on the platform because of all of the bottoms up creation. They've done a beautiful job of integrating social functionality into it. And I think that as a metaverse, they're here to stay and we'll see more metaverses take a page of that out of that book where they blur the line between creator and consumer creator and and viewer. And then the third thing are AR based metaverses. And so there's already some AR-based metaverse technologies. You could consider Snap to be this. You can consider Pokemon Go to be this. I think one of the most interesting things here is this idea that a digital universe can lay on top of a physical universe. And it goes a lot, I think, further than some of the gimmicky AR graphics technology and more into how do you create online social spaces that actually connect to offline social spaces. I think we're going to see really interesting innovation here around AirPods and audio-based apps. I think we're going to see interesting when, when the first realistically like mass adoptable glasses come out. I think we're going to see really interesting innovation. And then the fourth piece, which is the piece that I think gets all the press because it's, it's super interesting, is the VR-based metaverse. And I think because the fact that Meta, Facebook changed their name to, to Meta and the fact that people are starting to buy VR goggles at an increasingly fast pace, and there's been a lot of attention on the VR-based metaverse, but I think it's worth carving out as its own thing. Like, I think we could have a really interesting set of things happen from a metaverse perspective without actually all of that being within VR. Mm. It doesn't have to be a completely immersive and interruptive experience. I think the where we are from a VR perspective is it's a great gaming device. I think in the next three or four years, the next console war will be a war between TV devices and VR devices. So you'll have people deciding, should I buy you know, the next Xbox or the PS6, mm -hmm. or should I buy a VR-based device? And I think we're still some ways away from VR-based devices becoming mainstream enough that they have applications outside of gaming that have product market fit that are really the killer apps of those platforms. One of the co-founders of Google coined this term, the toothbrush test. Do you think Metaverse is ever going to be a concept like we're going to use it on a daily basis or at least twice a day? Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't heard that. So it's the, the idea of the toothbrush chest is we're going to use it every day. I think it will be for a set of people. I think for even now we can see for a set of gamers that are looking for a certain type of immersive entertainment that are essentially like plugged into their devices already, whether or not it's a gaming PC or a console. The fact that once the games on those devices get to the point where they're just as good from an immersive experience standpoint as the games on flat 2D devices, I think you'll start to see people spending a lot of time in those devices. And that will happen. And so there will be this kind of toothbrush uh, milestone for VR for a certain segment of users. 
I'm more skeptical about whether or not that happens in the mainstream. I think the devices have to change a lot. I think they have to get a lot less obtrusive for that to, to happen. And if they get a lot less obtrusive, I think the line between AR and VR starts to blur. I'm not sure that people want to completely take their, completely go from one vision of the world to a different mm -hmm. vision of the world and immerse themselves in that for long periods of time and multiple times a day. I think people do, you know, want to have the option to see what's happening in the real world as well as have a digital interface. But we'll see. It's a great uh, question. A really good way to look at it, I think. You talked about media. Uh, you've written a piece on entertainment value curve. Can you double click on that? Yeah, definitely. I was starting to think about what were some of the things that I was seeing at Facebook and Tinder around how people interact with each other. And around the time that I wrote the piece, there was something really interesting happening. TikTok was on fire. It was doing really well. And Quibi was on the decline. And you don't often get the ability to see two different realities play out and compare the two. But this was as close to that as possible. Mm -hmm. So you had two companies that wanted to innovate around mobile-centric snackable video. And one was incredibly successful and the other was not successful. And as I looked at what happened in video overall, there's a pattern that emerged where you have different players that are incredibly engaging that think about video in very different ways. And so on one side, you have TikTok where the video is very short format and very authentic. And then the other side, you have something like Netflix, where the video has Hollywood level production value and is longer format. And the, the things that really separate the two or, or distinguish the two is there's really two vectors that companies need to solve for when they think about how to create a great entertainment product. And I was specifically focused on video, but this applies to gaming and, and audio as well. And one vector is on the production value. And so you can have something like Netflix with Hollywood level production value, or you can have a really authentic impromptu picture of your friend wearing a Snapchat mask. And so those are on vastly a spectrums from a production value standpoint. And traditionally, Hollywood has thought about, you always want to be on the right end of that spectrum. You always want to have high production content. As we think about our own habits, we're spending a lot of time, hours a day, as people consuming content that is not high production value. So why is that? And that's because there's a second axis. There's an axis around social value. And that's really the access that the internet and mobile has driven a lot of innovation around. And so the insight behind the entertainment value curve is people are willing to spend time with entertainment that is low production quality if that entertainment is really socially valuable to them. So I'll spend you know, time going through pictures of my friends that are goofing off on Snapchat and having as much fun with it as I would watching a Kevin Hart special. The reason being is not because there's actually that funny from a production value standpoint in terms of the global definition of quality, but they're funny mm. to me because they're socially valuable. And so if you start to plot out all of the different companies that have been successful around social entertainment and around entertainment in general on a curve of social value versus production value, you start to see that there are some trends. And if you're going to have entertainment that is not as high production value, you need to make up for it in social value. And TikTok did this brilliantly. They enabled anyone to create video. That meant that the video had much more social value. People wanted to share the video and interact with the creators and create their own videos and mimic. And so it was a socially rich experience, even though the actual production quality of any given video is not that, that high. Meanwhile, Netflix optimizes for the other thing. They actually deliberately don't have social features in the app because they want you to sit back and Netflix and chill and just consume this incredibly great content that they've spent a lot of time, energy, and money to create. The problem with Quibi is that because it was shorter format and mobile-centric, they reduced the production value, but there was very little social functionality within the app. And so Quibi was a product that had lower production quality but not more social value. And as a result, it fell below this curve of product market fit. And they failed at creating snackable mobile video where TikTok succeeded. And so this idea of how do we combine the social relevance of content with the actual quality of that content into a package which is really effective is the premise of the piece. Brilliant. Platforms which have a creator and a consumer 
ecosystem built in need a community for it to really grow. But if it's just a consumption piece like Netflix, community may not be a key thing because at the end of the day, I am just getting enthralled or enticed by what I'm consuming. So do you think community is a key aspect to this? 100%. And Roblox is a really good example. You put Roblox up against any AAA gaming title, the latest Halo or Call of Duty or you know, Grand Theft Auto or whatever title, it's a night and day in terms of the difference in production quality. And most game creators would look at Roblox and say this could never be successful. But the thing that you miss just by looking at the aesthetics is the fact that it is a socially deep place to be. Post-pandemic, I have a 12-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old daughter. During the pandemic, when they were in lockdown, Roblox was the playground. And it was a playground in a very interesting way in the sense that the entire school or some large subset of the school, let's say 70% of the school, was on Roblox and they were playing in smaller groups of five people, groups of a couple people, and they could move around, a group could, could grow and then it could split apart and then other people could play with each other. And so the different games in Roblox were almost like running to different pieces of equipment on a playground. You had a certain set of folks at the slide, you had a certain set of kids at the monkey bars and everyone was on the playground together and they were moving very fluidly between social groups. And that created this incredibly socially valuable experience that made Roblox so much more compelling than you know, my kids also had switches. They also had an, X, an Xbox or a PlayStation. And so they didn't want to play that because it didn't have the social value. And so it's a really good observation. And I think increasingly, especially as we think about the metaverse and as this technology gets more sophisticated, as the graphics get better, as the interfaces get better, I think people are going to put too much value on the technology and the immersiveness and not enough stock in, is it a really interesting social place to be? Let's talk about founders. You have worked with world-class founders. What do you think? Founders are product people, marketing people, or they are communication PR oriented individuals? I think especially today, really successful founders almost always have some element of being product visionaries. So the mode of competition over the last 20 years has really shifted. It used to be that if you could build a factory and have economies of scale and be a great operational leader, then you could be a great entrepreneur that could build a sustainable business. But now a lot of those operations have been commoditized. It used to be that if you could you know, create a sales team and get that sales team to work really well, then you know that would could be a differentiation. A lot of those pieces have gotten commoditized or standardized to the point where the real way to compete in a new market is by understanding the customer and delivering something unique to the customer, which requires product sensibilities. I think I'm probably biased here because I am a product person, but I think most founders need at least some level of product vision and product understanding and value in order to be successful. And then alongside that, I think that different founders have different founder types. There are some that really understand sales or some that really understand marketing. There's some that really understand PR. And as a founder, the way to put yourself into a position to be really successful is to make sure that the things that you are great at map to the things that the market really needs. And then the second thing that's really important, I think, from a founder perspective is to be incredible at clearly communicating the strategy and bringing people in who complement your skills. Ultimately, any person is going to have things that they spike at. They're going to have things where there's gaps. The important thing is not to try to spend too much time closing the gaps or developing on the areas where you're not naturally talented, but instead to really invest in the areas where you are naturally talented and then put a complementary set of people around you. So that I think I really believe in this idea that Individual people, individual founders should be spiky and teams should be well-rounded. And that's a great way to make sure that you do lots of things, lots of things really well, rather than lots of things well, because no person can be great at everything. I think Reid Hoffman has been quoted in more or less words in saying, if you're not embarrassed with your first version of your product, you have launched too late. Do you agree or disagree? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So I just started a company a couple of months ago and... I am very much, there's a downside to this. I'm a perfectionist when it comes to product. I like to deliver beautiful things. I like to deliver things that work really well, where you're very confident that they're going to be successful. But doing that takes time. And during the time that you're doing that, 
you're not learning about what customers want. And so we've decided with this company that we would launch really early. We already have a product in market. We're, we're generating revenue. If everything goes right, we can deliver a really great experience to our users, but there's definitely rough edges. And so we absolutely shift that shift before we were at a point where we were not embarrassed by the product. There are definitely some things that are embarrassing about it. And I think it was the right decision. I think it's really good advice, despite the fact that intuitively it doesn't fit with how I like to approach things. It enables you to start getting feedback and input so that you can start to refine the direction. And that's been really great. I think if we had started on day one and said, we're going to build what we think is the right product and spend six months on it, uh, we would not have as good an end result as we ship something really early, a simple kind of no-code prototype. Now we're learning and the thing that we want to build has changed pretty significantly. Ravi, that's a good place to actually close this conversation. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here.